I'd like to thank our top sponsors, Ödes Bild & Nördrum, Anders Berge Christiansen and Joanna Cordos for making this show possible. And welcome to the 18th and who knows, perhaps the last episode of the Cave of Apelles. With me tonight is a most cherished friend and colleague. You dare to say it. I dare to say it. I've been trying to create a conversation structure, but to this second I have no idea what we're going to talk about. Boris Koller, welcome back to the Cave of Poets. I'm prepared. You have three cultured culture milk. milk. We should contact them. They could be our next sponsor. <laughs> and you send me this little book. You bought it. No, you sent it place. to me. Ah, I, I sent you it. sent it to me. Yeah, I don't have my copy available. This is uh, Adolf Hitler's speeches on cultural politics. Uh, but it's a, a clean edition for, yeah. uh, made by the House of Kunst in uh, München. Yeah. So they wanted uh, that artists have access to the actual uh, speeches yeah. Adolf Hitler helped. Because mm. that's, um, I think, one of the topics we'll be discussing. What he actually held, for, uh, what views he actually held when it comes to aesthetics, culture, art, what have you. And um, I think we'll be talking about 19th century painting. You've been, um, you've been do choosing? you really want to sell this format with Adolf on the first page? Like uh, any newspaper in, in uh, Germany uh, or in uh, USA does. It gets uh, the ratings Adolf up. Adolf yeah. on the first page always sells. Right. You see, <laughs> we need more viewers. Okay, let's start with 19th yeah. century instead. Painting. You've been posting quite a few 19th century paintings on World by Kitsch. Uh, I, I, uh, I took now care of uh, the Instagram uh, and uh, Facebook pages of Worldwide Kitsch and try to find examples uh, which are not only in the appearance but also historically seen Kitsch. Right. So um, I am not allowed to go much further back than the 1750s when thinking about this. Right. Because, I mean, that, that's one thing I've been thinking about. You, you know, from a kid's perspective, I mean, or from just from an objective perspective, it's wrong to say that Rembrandt was an artist. But strictly speaking, you, you cannot say that he's kitsch either. He was never a, a, a kitsch painter. He because it's, a, he painted before the term came into existence. Seen with modern eyes, and we have, uh, I have to say, we have modern eyes. We went through some educations. I studied uh, several uh, state-funded art schools. Mm. So uh, I have been brought up with this thinking. And uh, then you are not allowed to say that he was a kitsch painter. But uh, of course he uh, was uh, using uh, kitsch values in his right. uh, paintings. I don't right. want to say work. This is an uh, art concept too. <laughs> well, I mean, I, as far as I can see, you can say an art object and you can say a kitsch work because it implies work which implies skill. But when you want to use the word uh, work, then there is only one word for it, opera. <laughs> right. This is the work you can do in your life when mm -hmm. you're a man <laughs> and able to write. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, you know, but this fantastic uh, um, European tradition of organizing in uh, the most... Uh, um, dictatoric way uh, is uh, to organize an orchestra and s by someone who dictates in written form what to do. 
it's the perfect uh, example for dictatorship. That it was no state uh, which uh, was so well organized in this form of di dictatorship. It has to be exact, uh, exactly the music which is written. And uh, the composer and uh, conductor Bernstein tried to find uh, an explanation for what is uh, different with uh, the Western tradition of uh, orchestral uh, or classical music. It's not the perfect word for it. And other forms of music. And he tried to explain it by calling uh, this concept exact music. I do not agree, but uh, uh, he thought that this is the most exact music you can develop. The Western and this is, this is in the form of organizing a perfect form of dictatorship. Did you ever hear of uh, democratic values in uh, orchestral music? That would be a <laughs> catastrophe, I believe. Uh, it could be an important uh, part of art. Of uh, art. Every sure. musician is deciding what he plays and doesn't take care <laughs> of the others. Mm, but this is an anarchistic uh, concept then. So uh, in organizing, someone has to say in which direction it could go. Hmm. So when we're talking about democratic values in the West, Certainly not in orchestral music. Well, I mean, if, if you, I mean, in painting, to talk about democracy would be a complete catastrophe. And that's the whole problem with modern figurative painting: is that it's so democratic, everything is equally w well depicted, equally well lighted, and there's no focus, and so you get art, completely indifferent. Um, it was uh, fun for a certain period when one uh, was uh, abstract painting in favor for a short time. Mm. Abstract painting does not exist on its own. Uh, uh, so uh, every painting is an abstractation uh, of, of uh, something else. Uh, but uh, the non-figurative painting uh, made uh, itself open for, for uh, the viewer or the customer uh, to, to be uh, to give uh, space for interpretation. Mm. Uh, so it could be anything figurative. So a customer came and saw something in it. Yeah. So uh, it's in the human nature that uh, you try to find uh, uh, an explanation uh, uh, which has contact with reality. When you look at a piece of wood, uh, you would tr see at once faces in it or, or forms, figures, landscape. Uh, the, it's in the human nature. And this was a, a strong force for, for abstract painting. Mm. Uh, it was a form of liberating uh, the content. Everyone can decide what's in the painting. Yeah, it's, but uh, it was the wrong form uh, to read it. Well, I think didn't I read somewhere one of the people who have the introduction for the the speeches here, Bor Boris Groys. Uh -huh. I believe you sent me an article once where he talks about. Uh, modern art, contemporary art, mm -hmm. because you know one of the things um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about that we did talk about last time is the whole idea of connecting figurative painting to the National Socialists and seeing them as you know this guilt by association tactic. But then Boris Groys is writing that you, what you have to understand is, as far as I remember him him writing, is that contemporary art is so without content that it's ev even more or at least at l uh, as much uh, uh, malleable to for political propaganda because you can put anything into it. What did you say there? That <laughs> modern art, contemporary art, is very well equipped for being used as political propaganda because there is no story, there is no content there, anything can be put into it. Who decides what art is? Who does? The artist? Certain the market? Ones. The state? The state and the curators, art historians. But that's a funny thing. I remember, uh, I think, 
I had talked once to Arthur Danto. I met him on a couple of occasions. And we were to- I was talking about how Hegel has this imperative that there's, there are certain things you have to do. And he had mentioned that when he met Odd Nordermans in Iceland. And, uh, and he said, well, you know, they were talking about what, where, which direction do things go. And then uh, they were talking about the sidecast and these things. And then Odd Nordrum, of course, talked about figurative painting. And Dante was replying something like, well, it's not time for it now. And he was one of those who really was in charge of deciding where things are going, right? And he was obviously waiting for someone else to decide where things were going. When you are uh, killing a tradition off, and this is what has been done, mm. it's not possible to get the tradition up again. And this is what we see in a uh, painting of the uh, 1800s, the 19th uh, century. Yeah. Um, the tradition of painting was over. They uh, killed it off in France, in uh, what is today Germany. With the whole naturalist uh, uh, attitude, or it was it naturalist, uh, like um, the, the, the bureaucratic sixteen hundred, seventeen hundreds uh, paintings. Was it naturalist? They couldn't think of anything else uh, but uh, representative paintings. Mm. But uh, they had a new concept developed in the Vatican with German help, uh, art. And it was uh, in the beginning a concept against the uh, Jesuits in uh, France. Uh, they tried to install the uh, term art with a concept. The Jesuits? Uh, it was against the Jesuits. Against, against the Jesuits. Ag- against them. Yeah. They had another agenda uh, in France uh, right. where they had a strong stand before the revolution. So the Pope came into the picture with the, some cardinals and uh, tried uh, to install a new term. doesn't just happen that there comes an idea right. without uh, uh, any uh, structure behind and it takes over. Okay, so, but, but uh, and it, with the Vatican in the uh, 1700s, you have one of the strongest uh, structures uh, behind uh, a new term. And in the uh, 1760s, uh, the term was fully developed and uh, spread from Rome and Germany. But now you're talking about Winkelmann, Johann Winkelmann, Winkelmann's uh, book. Yeah. But th- I've been wondering about that because, um, you know, you might, I mean, one of the things I wanted to talk about is, you know, possible traps of the kids, kids position that you, there are certain things you look a lot at and then you, you miss, can miss uh, looking into things. And uh, the typical thing is to tie the whole art concept back to Kant, but this is later. Now you're talking about the, the Vatican being involved and in clearly having an idea what the concept of art would do to culture? Or? They had a concept first and didn't really know how to begin. But was it something As completely different from what began. Kant uh, later describes? Or, I mean, I, I've heard that, uh, well, if art had gone more sort of along the lines of Winkelmann, it would be the classical values and we would have a different situation. So art could you have see, become... You see, there is a problem with classical values. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the nowadays called uh, Baroque times, they uh, didn't try to uh, uh, find something new. They tried to develop uh, the old tradition, uh, which was a Mediterranean tradition, they thought. uh, And uh, the basis was the old Rome. And when you are building something or painting something in Rome, you have a stable ground in in, uh, these uh, antique uh, findings. 
So they thought they could begin again uh, with uh, a new concept, but from the beginning. And then it had to be classical. So you're saying art was an attempt to go back to the classical values? It was, certainly it was, uh, in uh, so, Winkelmann's uh, uh, and the Pope's opinion. So was it uh, later perverted and turned into what we know it as today? What do you want to call perverted? Uh, well, when art, which... When we're so including. <laughs> <laughs> when art, with a little a, means knowledge, and you take that term and you turn it into, into uh, the meaning non-knowledge, that is a perversion, or an inversion at least, if we shall be very democratic uh. and uh, diplomatic. Uh, the point again is, if you would not have Count Hegel later, you would just have Winkelmann, then we would be, would, we would be totally fine as classical you had theater painters. Winkelmann and then you had the French Revolution, mm. which was uh, the American mm. Revolution. Um, uh, and his, the first stand, the first step into Europe. So French noblemen uh, were going to America, trying that out what, how you could organize um, a revolution, and came back with this experience to France, and they tried to get it right. And then you have really a problem uh, with. Uh, some things which remain, people, artifacts. So what are you doing with uh, these people and artifacts? Certain families and uh, paintings which represent these families. Hmm. Well, this is, um, this is this article that you sent me, which is, an, uh, I really, really can recommend iconoclasm during the French Revolution. Just wanted to mention that. <laughs> Uh, uh, I could go into details, but maybe later on. Uh, but uh, it's worth to read it because uh, this article uh, tries uh, to uh, get you uh, into the thinking what a museum was uh, in the times of the revolution. Mm. And uh, you stood uh, in front of a big problem. Uh, what is now more or less France, or was France this time, there were about 25 million people living in what is now France. Um, six million people about uh, didn't talk uh, French at all, didn't understand French. There were about three million people speaking French, and many in between. So it was not what what you think um, now uh, about uh, the Grand Nation, uh, the, the 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 wonderful people, and uh, they are home again, and they have one language. It was not like that. Mm. Uh, and then the first orders came out in building not only a revolution, but the country in a completely other form, a state in a completely other form. When you come from, from the uh, famous quotation, uh, Louis XIV, uh, l'état c'est moi, the state, it's me. Mm. Then you have a only one person who is the state. Everyone else is not part of the state. Mm -hmm. And uh, you try to go from this concept and uh, try to include everyone but uh, uh, the, uh, the king. <laughs> uh, then you, uh, this is a big project. And they sent orders out to destroy everything which uh, represented uh, the old regime. So you send out basically uh, information till 25 million people uh, that you have to destroy everything which looks old. Yeah. They really saw that that is a problem, but not at once. Uh, uh, Diderot uh, 
brought, brought about uh, uh, it that he really uh, wishes himself iconoclasm. Uh, it would be a wonderful thing, but he uh, thought it's not possible to uh, make it in the whole country. <laughs> so <laughs> think about that. French culture and people, agriculture, it, it was a big cost catastrophe for, for the farmers in what is now France. And uh, the remains uh, in architecture, the uh, emblems, uh, the paintings. And then they saw that there is a problem, so we have to rescue something. They tried to form a commission with about 30 people to protect some things. 30 people against 25 million. <laughs> Because we're talking about sculpture and painting yeah. from ch churches and <laughs> so uh, yeah. it, it uh, the monument man about yeah. and it, it it was then the, uh, the same story uh, destroy everything and then you have a, a, a little task force uh, uh, protecting the private parts <laughs> and then they uh, found a tool for uh, this form of iconoclasm. The museum. Right. So the Pope began with the concept, more or less. There were no museums, there were collections, there were uh, the term, maybe, but nobody knew what you can do with, with a museum. Now, well, when you had this, um, uh, that's the fun thing you had the, the Cabinet of Curiosities, Wunderkammer, or you had the, the art chambers, so called. And I remember looking at that, there, there was this art chamber from in Dresden, I believe, in the 16th century. Mm -hmm. And it says Kunstkammer. Yeah. And I went through the list of the contents, and I think one, uh, there was 1%, one percent was, was, was the, paint, painting or yeah. something like that. Yeah. And the reason Representing why, what is in the collection more or less. Right, right. Like, or document, strange animals. like doc <laughs> documentation. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So it was not something you went to look at as art, it was just documentation. Uh, beautiful uh, craft works and, and more yeah. or less uh, it was a concept for what is now natural history. Yeah, yeah. So the article uh, describes this situation and it sees uh, the museums as a tool for iconoclasm. Yeah. So but why? You have I mean, why is that? Why is that, uh, that the problem? And uh, I had uh, Doug Sulley sitting here, and he was talking about how that uh, the, the institution of the museum saved a lot of things from being destroyed. So you would think that's a good thing. What is the structural use uh, usage uh, of a museum nowadays in a town? It's a safe space for uh, old artifacts and tourist. So people from the wrong place and artifacts from the wrong time. <laughs> and you have a, a place where you put them together so that they are not uh, uh, in the rest of the town. So you right. protect yourself from these old things and the tourists. <laughs> I think you, uh, or I guess we talked about it once, that the museums teach you what not to do. So did them don't do it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, right. So the bad and example. That, that's the uh, iconoclastic. Uh, I mean, it, it does say at the end here, uh, immure a political symbol in a museum and it becomes merely art. Iconoclasm is thus achieved without destruction. I mean, is it the same thing? I mean, I remember I was in, in Vienna. Uh, good old times. <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, I used to go to the opera all the time. And uh, they had staged Othello. Where is Othello? And of course they had done it, they had artified it with neon signs and stuff like that. But the singers were so good and so good actors that they couldn't destroy it. It was too much alive. And I was sitting there, and you, you know what's going on, but I was thinking, my God, he's actually managing to trick Othello. 
I didn't think he would have been able to do it one more time. <laughs> uh, these musicians and these singers, they are very well trained yeah. uh, for a, a system which is protecting you from what could be done. You, you were in the opera house yeah. and you listened to uh, Otello. How old is this opera? Oh, when was it made? I'm not sure. <laughs> and when you go to a museum, what do you want to see? Something from 1600s. So, it's over. Mm. It's gone. Mm. So, they, these places are the wrong places for the wrong stuff and a lot of energy and resources goes into it and this is a very big problem for what could what uh, we could do here and now yeah. new paintings new music why are so they what? playing old music in in the concert halls and uh, the opera houses There is an official explanation and there is a very pragmatic uh, uh, one. And which ones are those? The official explanation uh, in music is that they don't have the resources to study new music. So they uh, cannot allow themselves uh, to play uh, new music, only old, which they studied already. So there you have the settings and, and, and everyone knows how to do it and uh, everything is fine for the... And there is the non-official uh, explanation. When you play only what is called today new music, who would want to listen to this stuff? Right. Yeah? You would have uh, empty houses. Uh, it went uh, differently for for uh, for art, so no, no man spreading. So I tried to act as a well-educated person in front of the camera. I will come back to a more comfortable uh, uh, sitting position afterwards. Yeah, if you lose the beard too, it's fine. So the. Museums are not only protecting the old artifacts, but they are protecting you from a painting new stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, all, all this has a double meaning. This is why I always, and I will come back to this, advocated for uh, closing all the museums for the public. Uh, you should... Uh, conserve uh, the old artifacts, the old paintings, but uh, normal people should not have, as in the old times, have access to it. Not even in print. So that you have... Uh, they it's not a culture-less situation then. But then people are demanding something. The, when they want to have it, mm -hmm. and when they want to pay for it, And it has to be new. And we had this situation once in the 1700s. Mm. When you. Yeah, yeah but I mean, at, at that time, you didn't go to museums to see these things. No one. And in the 19th century, there were actually new things by Brahms, by Mahler, etc., Bruckner, that were uh, played. Uh, the different uh, uh, time circles for, for music and uh, painting and architecture. Yeah. So it's difficult to uh, compare uh, the contemporary uh, doings in music uh, and, and painting and architecture. I do not want to call it art. Um, so uh, you have a, a quite old structure surviving in music until the 20th century, until uh, Richard Strauss, more or less. Uh, it went a little bit differently with, with painting. 
Uh, now uh, coming back to uh, the attempts uh, in uh, new uh, antique works uh, when they organized the revolution they wanted they were used to it present something new and beautiful but not Christian and with no contact to uh, uh, the old aristocracy mm. And they thought they have to go back uh, to uh, the old Greek and Roman uh, representings of many gods, new time structure, a new form of beauty in the old clothes, with a new closed, because it was not written, propaganda book uh, instead of the Bible. And they went from village to village to install this new antique religion. So in the beginning uh, and until the end of the revolution, you have a form of um, classicism. This is the meaning that you begin again one yeah. more time. Yeah. So when uh, and it was also, I think, the uh, architect uh, Laws in Austria wrote about this. You should read Laws, uh, he describes uh, modernism from the inside in a very beautiful way, clear, uh, it's easy to read. Uh, he uses the right terms, uh, the only term he doesn't use uh, is kitsch. Right. Uh, but the, the rest is in place and uh, he tries uh, to understand uh, this cultural development uh, with uh, biological words. I know you are not allowed to do this today, but you're they, you, they will call you a biologist. Uh, but uh, it was laws, it was a uh, uh, hundred years ago uh, and uh, he comes with uh, the thinking of uh, ontogenese or, uh, and phylogenese. Which is what? Uh, the development uh, of uh, an individual uh, living form uh, has to go all the way of the evolution in the own development. So when an embryo is developing, the embryo has to go through all stages in the previous uh, evolution. And with the birth, uh, the, uh, when we think about human beings, uh, the human being has to go through the evolution uh, in the uh, species. So when the species is ready, there is birth, and then you have to learn and uh, to, to be a grown up. And uh, he saw this development in uh, the visual representation of the 19th century, 1800s. And it's it's really uh, striking when when you see uh, the development from uh, neoclassicism over uh, neo gothic to neo baroque uh, under napoleon the uh, 3rd you have all the development uh, of uh, the european understand standing yeah um, at one more time so when you go into the uh, 1900 1800s 19th century then you find uh, the development again so art was born came into being uh, with the revolution and had then take the long road of the evolution until the 20th century to be a grown-up. Right, okay. Without ornament, without losing time. Because laws 
uh, saw all uh, advanced craft as uh, something you do when you don't w uh, know what to do with your time. Then you invest into a uh, craft. All the small holes in the shoe, it's wasted time. He wanted to have a shoe without the small holes. I do not want to think uh, how he, he, he smiled in his feet, but uh, this, this is modernism. Uh, <laughs> he wanted Everything. to have modern, mm. uh, stinking shoes. <laughs> he writes about it. <laughs> not, not, the <laughs> not the smell, but... Uh, <laughs> mm. And then you are in the uh, 1900s, 20th century. And then you have the propaganda for the grown-up. Mm. Who should that be? Well, I th one thing I see as a, uh, as a really great problem, and I, I remember that there were, there were two students once, and uh, a couple, and he was a sculptor. And at the same time, he was going around reading a biography on Willem de Kooning. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were talking about uh, Thomas Kincaid, you know, with a, with a cabin by the lake and uh, there's a deer there or whatever. So, you know, t what oh. people would typically would call kitsch. Oh, yeah. Um, and, uh, and he was laughing at that. And I said to him, well, you, you understand, you, you're much closer to Thomas Kincaid than you are to de Kooning. And he, he just couldn't get that. So, I mean, it's uh, um, the, the big problem for a lot of uh, representational painters is that they buy that official history without any kind of, of uh, uh, resistance. And so they perpetuate these, these values so it can never be born again. But it's of no importance for the system. It's of importance for, for us because <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we are tend to see these people as colleagues and mm. they are not. They are continuously uh, children. And uh, the problem is uh, when you saw the truth uh, and uh, you are a grown up, then you're uh, thrown out of Eden. And uh, this is a bigger problem for me than for you. Because I am seen as an apostate uh, from the real religion uh, art. Because I had the opportunity to study art uh, on two uh, art academies. Mm -hmm. So they showed me the splendor of art. And I willingly... Uh, didn't accept it. Did not accept it, no. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so, I'm a really evil person for art yeah. because I'm a grown-up and you're not, you're a child, you never started at the academy, so you didn't get uh, the uh, opportunity. So, maybe uh, art will uh, take you into heaven because you're innocent. Right. I'm not. <laughs> and uh, these, these people there, they are children. They're not grown up in painting. They're not grown up so, so, in, in art. Uh, so this is what the, the art world uh, has a concept for. And it's, it's a fantasy they have, which does not exist. And it's uh, the concept uh, of a classical uh, painting. Mm -hmm. Where is this conventional classical painting? Well, what do you think about the, uh, the so-called atelier movement then? This, all this no, 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 no. These are the uh, second uh, generation uh, and uh, they really do not know in this uh, pyramid uh, uh, structure uh, what uh, they are really doing. Because uh, uh, Kessner, uh, Erich Kessner once had a, a good uh, saying in German, I hope you can translate it, was immer auch geschieht, 
nie dürft ihr so tief sinken von dem Kakao, durch den man euch zieht, auch noch zu, tr zu trinken. So, uh, whatever happens, uh, you should never sink that deep that uh, you uh, begin to drink from the chocolate milk you are put into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. And he yeah. said this in another direction, but they are uh, taking the common narrative and saying yes to it because they hope that they are rescued by art uh, well, when they are calling themselves for artists. Uh, we took a similar way but out of art because we saw that we don't have a place in art so we have to go out of art but it's a bad Kitsch is a bad word for the art world. So it's up to us uh, to value uh, these values and the word, and the uh, term. It struck me at one point, <clears throat> uh, you know, if you, let's say you have the most uh, poisonous spider in the world. I don't know, this probably has a Latin name. You say that Latin name to someone, and they're like, what, what's that? And then you say it's a spider, and they might start to wonder. And then you say how big it is, where it lives, that it's poisonous, and that it's the most poisonous in the whole world. And then they start getting really skeptical. But when you say kitsch, immediately, no, 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 I don't want anything to do with that. How do you think, I mean, they, it's not like they necessarily have read Brock, Greenberg, Kolka, Hans Dieter Gilfert, all of these people, but they still immediately feel that this is the wrong term. This is something they should not be in contact with. I mean, forget that they, uh, a lot of these uh, academic painters are so concerned with just making paintings. So in that sense, they are figurative artists because it's quite indifferent. There's no story going on, there's just depiction, right? But uh, uh, how can they feel that this is not something, that this is something they should not be in touch with? There are different countries and different uh, cultural backgrounds in Europe. And I'm talking now... Uh, but mainly, America, I mean, it's, it's a big thing in America, I'm, right? I'm, I'm, I'm t we come uh, to it. Uh, now I'm talking mainly about Europe because this is what I know best. I was never in the US, so... Uh, it's, 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 it's wonderful because they have no, uh, no real uh, culture and I want to build uh, with others a structure without uh, this form of culture uh, because it opens for something new, which is the I mean, old thing. When you keep the old thing, uh, you have to make something new. But when you, uh, as, as, as I, uh, when you're coming from, from uh, Austria, and you, there you had at the place, and I do not go into antique times, when, when I think about a reformation uh, to uh, Lutheran uh, belief, they uh, changed their belief to uh, the Lutheran church. Then they were forced back into the Catholic church. Then there were national socialists. Then they had to re-educate themselves uh, into uh, being uh, anti-national uh, socialistic. Mm. Uh, when this collective memory has learned that you should always be on the right side and shut your mouth, smile and shut your mouth, then you really have a problem with something controversial. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, when you're making a painting, you want to sell the painting. I mean, so uh, it's, it's always the same. Uh, you cannot sell uh, a new concept or new uh, stuff to people because people with money and they have uh, their own religion and it's called money. <laughs> they only uh, want to be the first of the second uh, who are coming buying something. They do not want to be the first. So when nobody begins to invest in a system 
uh, then uh, nobody will begin to invest in the system. So everyone uh, uh, among these painters uh, wants to survive and find a safe space and uh, not as, uh, as an individual but as someone who is coming from a cultural background uh, over many generations uh, uh, which learned that, that no reform is a good reform. You keep what you have. And uh, the most conservative way is to keep now modernism mm -hmm. and art. You will not get uh, poor people into uh, trying something new which is old. <laughs> but is there, is there, um, uh, I mean, when you're talking about the whole man spreading, man spreading, yeah. <laughs> speaking of man spreading, when you're talking about kitsch, should it be packaged differently? Should it be formulated differently? The way it's been done until now, is there a completely different way of doing it? I mean, it took like, uh, you know, basically it took uh, at least like 70, 80 years really for the art term to be really generally established. So it's been like 20 years now. Is that a short time yeah, or a long time? Art uh, was uh, able to do, the art system was able to do it uh, because they made about everything uh, Kitsch is accused for, uh, like uh, mass production, mm. cheap mass production, uh, and uh, the false feelings and everything Kitsch is accused for, art was and is doing. Mm. <laughs> uh, so it's a complete new system. And uh, you uh, will not, when, when, when you have these more than conservative uh, values, you will not get conservatives into investing in it when they have a secure conservative structure. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a thinking about demographics. Uh, I can talk now for, for what is today Austria. In the Baroque times, there were about three million people there. In the medieval times, uh, one and a half million people. Uh, it's a lot. In Sweden, uh, in the medieval times, uh, some several hundred thousand people. Not that many people. Of uh, these uh, people, uh, about 90 to 95 percent were, uh, were occupied with. Uh, agriculture. So the, uh, the cultural processes behind agriculture had no access to these people. What happened then in the towns were well, several thousand people. Of these several thousand people, uh, women were not involved in the workforce. So you can really reduce the importance of uh, one man to uh, something which would quite big today. So one man in the Baroque time was uh, demographically worth maybe 100 men today. Mm -hmm. So it, to be relevant, it has to be a bigger movement. Right. And uh, you will come uh, into many hundred players in the game in a small country like Norway, uh, Sweden, Austria, uh, which is uh, system relevant. People are today not as important uh, as they were once. And this hurts a lot. And when you now see um, that uh, with many people coming from outside Europe and the old families are reducing themselves, or with help of the state, maybe they don't have uh, children anymore. The old populations go now down. This uh, could be uh, shown in a country like Austria, like that we have now 
but with uh, another demographic structure about the population of the 1960s already. So the mm. old population uh, and their relevance is going down. When you see that there are fewer and fewer people, but you have a lot of artifacts in family collections. And I see this uh, on the market for antiquities like uh, Baroque paintings, paintings from the 19th century until the uh, 1950s, beautiful figurative stuff. Prices go, and you'll see uh, how it's connected with demographics, prices go down because there are no new families with children and children after them investing in this kind of stuff when they are as conservative as these families are already integrated in the new system which took completely over so the prices for uh, the old paintings are going down what do you want with new newly made paintings which look a lot like the old paintings and are so that you can survive on these paintings more expensive because you do not come from a market but you want to pay your living with it mm -hmm. so you compete in a shrinking market uh, with uh, something uh, nobody really uh, has uh, use for well, <laughs> so give me an answer there <laughs> yeah well that's what i'm thinking about too what, what is it possible to do anything in that kind of situation? I mean, d d another thing that uh, I was thinking about that we, we uh, did talk about <coughs> is, um, this is a book, by the way, that I can recommend, The Darkening Age by Catherine Nixie. It's about how uh, the Christian destruction of the classical world and how the Seulets in the very beginning, for example, took this Athena figure in Palmyra and decapitated her. Oh, art. Yeah. And then it's found again and it's restored and then ISIS come and they decapitate her and destroy her again. Yeah. Uh, so then you have uh, uh, quite similar movements to the art uh, idea, right? And it's uh, what struck me when I heard about these things about what ISIS did or what, uh, or the, the Taliban in Afghanistan with the blowing up the, the Bamiyan the, uh, Buddha figure, is that this is surprisingly Western in its attitude. You take a sculpture and you turn it into art. So they see the sculpture as something of importance. They were locked uh, away in, in the safe space, uh, in the iconoclastic safe space museum already, many of them. Mm. Oh, so they show that these sculptures are more important as they are for them. There's something beautiful. You see, uh, the bronzes uh, in the European towns, were, which were collected over time, representing uh, uh, public figures, Mostly, and I love it, man on horses, yeah, or the Pope, uh, for example, the, the, the wonderful statue of, of uh, Julius in, uh, in what is now Italy. Uh, I think it was made by, by Michelangelo. And uh, they made a canon out of Julius. And because of the female form, uh, this canon got the name Julia. <laughs> <laughs> so, when you see these statues, then you should not only see them as statues, but as a representation of continuity. Yeah. So, uh, of, over a certain period, it was possible uh, for the structure to protect these images. And uh, it's the same with uh, uh, bells in the uh, church towers, uh, which they uh, made into uh, canons too. And it's the same symbolism with the biggest uh, bell in, in Austria, 
which has a male name, the Pomerin. Uh, it's uh, a speaking name, Pomerin, uh, which is made out of Turkish cannons. <laughs> Right. So there has to be peace again. So they went the other way. It's a wonderful symbolism. Make uh, statues out of cannons. <laughs> it's recycling. That's quite environmentally the, uh, friendly. So uh, all the time in this form of re recycling, and this is why I do not advocate for uh, stone uh, sculptures. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you right. can build roads with them, but... <laughs> Yeah, but I'm thinking, I mean, of course, these are extreme cases. Um, early Christianity, and you have uh, extreme cases like ISIS. But there's also the general idea of aniconism in Islam. And Islam has a growing presence in Europe. How do you think that will affect uh, the future of what, representational painting? Because, I mean, if you look at the shelf here, this is a, <laughs> this is a Muslim, oh. uh, the, uh, Muslim art, and then, uh, Islamic sorry, art. Sorry, you're coming with, with a big, big question and mm. give, give me a little bit time to think about it. <laughs> I don't have a solution for everything. I when I say something, I know it's true, <laughs> uh, but uh, I cannot say a true thing to everything. <laughs> So, how many hours uh, do we have uh, for we have our YouTube uh, versions? Five or six, yeah. <laughs> uh. Uh, what is the future for art in Europe? I, I personally, I do not see, see a, a bright uh, future for art in Europe uh, as it is now. There will be an art structure for a long time. It's a well-established religion, state-funded, uh, so as long as the state stands, and that we have a uh, time circus, uh, we could talk about this, uh, the bigger uh, time circle is about 250 years for a structure and uh, more or less 100 years for a democratic situation. Then the uh, system crashes or the people crash. Mm -hmm. So there is no way out of these uh, uh, up and down. And now you see uh, this uh, strong state-funded uh, structure uh, with uh, the tools for their own iconoclasm museums. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and they have already big problems uh, with not only financing uh, the system, but uh, holding the system going because there is no market anymore uh, for the mo also the most modernist stuff. Um, you saw in the development that many of the galleries in Germany close or the move to Berlin. You cannot sell in Berlin. Everyone in the uh, structure in, in the industry knows it. It's not the place to sell, but it's the last place to be. So the last galleries uh, which survive, they go to Berlin. Uh, I talked uh, with several gallerists uh, who were really gallerists and not the, uh, they were not um, making what a gallery in Germany usually does, money laundry. <laughs> It's, a, it's about that. Uh, they know internally, for, for example, um, uh, about 90% of the galleries in Munich, Germany, uh, were only there for money laundry. Not, not even, they did not, did not even bother uh, to uh, hide it in, in buying and selling art. It was only money laundry. So you cannot take these galleries in account. Mm -hmm. uh, and the few remaining galleries for art 
they are closing. Talk with them. I talk with several gallerists who were closing. It's not long possible for this gallery structure. And it's a new structure, uh, more or less introduced in the late uh, 1800s. So it's very valuable uh, for the uh, understanding and understatement of art. Uh, to see the importance of galleries for art, but not for painting, not at all. Museums are not important uh, for painting and art galleries are uh, not important uh, for painting. And I go as far that I say museums and galleries are tools for killing off the painting, painting right. traditions. Right. And that's why I mentioned this idea of anachronism, a picture ban. Uh, and this is why I, I mentioned the book by Nixie too, because it is something that seems to be an all too human uh, uh, problem. Because I remember once in the radio, I, I listened to an, an art historian and he was so infatuated with an installation that was a projection on a museum of flames. So it looked like the whole museum was going up in flames. And this is what they call deep Freudian shit in American lingo. I and mean, there's a, it seems to me to be a very clear match between the, the principle of, of anachronism in Islam and in art. So it, it's, it's, not a, it's not really a culture crash at all, but it's a problem for, well, classical culture, representational painting. You have uh, once expanding and it's a very important part uh, for the concept, a once expanding uh, art system. Yeah. And I was, uh, for example, in Kassel, uh, at the place uh, of the, uh, it's a Biennale. The uh, Documenta, is that? Uh, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the Documenta. And it was at the place where they uh, took the old uh, paintings from the old museum out uh, uh, to uh, make space for art. So uh, this was symbolism. So this is one step. When the place is holy enough, you, you can expand into it uh, with, with art. Right. Or you are building new places. And this is a funny story. Uh, one of my best uh, customers, um, he was in a board is not uh, among us anymore. So this is why. Uh, I'm speaking in the past. Um, he uh, was also in the board of the uh, Museum for Modern Art in Vienna. And he really liked me. It was never possible for him to get me into the art system. I saw many smiling faces, sweet smiling faces, <laughs> which said to me... Kill you with a smile? Uh, why do you bother? <laughs> To, to, to even be at the place. Yeah. So, and he was coming to me because he wanted to hear from me. They had a big problem. They had a new museum complex, newly built in the midtown. They made a very big bunker for art, uh, art storage, so that art can be secure. I do not think they built it for, for, for art, but uh, for the politicians uh, from the parliament nearby. This is my theory. But <laughs> so a newly built uh, art museum from the future of modern art with space for art storage. Everything was full at once. They had too much stuff the state already bought. They had no space at all. And he was coming to me, asking me if I had a solution. I uh, do not want to, to, to mention what I said to him, but it was an environment-friendly solution. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So they are constantly expanding, and now you see the same demographic problem. Uh, these conservatives uh, who are 
um, interested in this form of culture. This is what they uh, learned uh, over three generations now. Art is something important. You have to keep it. So they want uh, uh, to invest their efforts and the money into it. And the state does everything to keep art. And it's not longer possible to expand. They're now in a situation where they are collapsing already. The gallery system does not work anymore. Uh, the state funding will not work for a much longer time. And now you have, and this is the next step, to see what you can make for space for many people to come. Because in uh, about 20, 30 years, uh, the relevant population of uh, the old type is died out. And people with strong cultural uh, heritage and belief installed themselves and have to be a natural part of the system, of the state, and as long as art is a part uh, of the state, or state-funded, they uh, have a right to be a part of it. So it's now the very important discussion in several countries, uh, I observe it in Norway, in Sweden, in Germany, and in Austria, more or less, uh, that uh, people uh, who came during the last years have different backgrounds, which are not European, have to be integrated as fast as possible into the art system, into the juries, into the boards. So you have a conflict that you need uh, the old uh, system keepers, but you're changing uh, the appearance uh, even faster than uh, the appearance of the people which will come in 20, 30 years. Art as a system, uh, modern art, is very well adapted to it, I think. Because, as you mentioned it, they do not really need the image. It's important uh, to have a concept and you are free to integrate and to have maybe also some traditions when they are relevant for, 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 for sociologically. Uh, so they are changing, they will change a lot. But do not expect that people who are coming with a strong heritage will adapt to something which is no longer adapt, uh, uh, protected by uh, the state-funded uh, systems. So. What are we doing with um, uh, the old collections, the tools of uh, iconoclasm, the museums, where there is this disgusting stuff, all these mm. naked women, and uh, it can only cause uh, sexual arousement. So it, 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 what, what are you doing with this stuff which is uh, morally not acceptable for a, a, a church or a, a for the new system and for the people to come. Do you have an answer there? What you do with the works that are already in the museums. <laughs> you should sell them to <laughs> private people. <laughs> yeah, who would who would even bother to buy it? Well, Be because then then the family has to protect the painting over generations. No. You take responsibility when you buy a painting. You are investing more money in keeping the painting than in buying the painting. Right, right. right. So it's you have to invest for a long period of time. Give me an answer. <laughs> I don't have an answer right now. So but what? It, but what's, uh, what is uh, really apparent, you know, reading about the, the whole idea of anachronism and what when there are figures in uh, Islamic art, they are decorative, more or less sort of like Matisse in some way. 
and you have uh, decided. I, you, I, mean, I made a Google research. I know I'm, I'm a bad guy. I tried to find out what is Islamic art is. Hmm. Beautiful carpets. Do, do you know that it's very difficult uh, to sell per, uh, Persian uh, carpets nowadays? Why? <laughs> there are so many. <laughs> yep. but I have another story for you. <laughs> uh, I have a, a very good, a wonderful friend in Indiana. Uh, he, it was Mehdi Sachadi. He was the painter for the Persian court uh, and the Persian uh, emperor, uh, the Shah. Shah. Mm. Uh, he made uh, the big portraits. Uh, he worked also for the state and he had the market for uh, his Persian friends in the US and in Europe. And he was bought in uh, Arabia a lot because these were the times where you could have in secret paintings of yourself as long as you are a man. And the funny thing, uh, as always, I, uh, I love food. I like to have my food daily. So <laughs> we had an agreement. I got Persian food. He uh, was in the kitchen and uh, made Persian food for me, as he did for the Shah, who liked his cooking. <laughs> and I sat there and painted all these Arabs. <laughs> I made uh, portraits uh, of uh, Arabian sheikhs. Uh, and <laughs> he then, when it was nearly finished, came. No and made everything a little bit softer, more shiny and more kitschy, so that they really come to like it. <laughs> Not as realistic as I made them. <laughs> but that, I mean, that was a little, this sort of a little intermezzo. I mean, there's also, this, there's also the story about, about uh, Gentile Bellini being sent to the, the Grand Turk, I believe, painting a portrait over him, and he was really impressed but still he understood that uh, politically or religiously he couldn't you know, advocate that type of painting uh -huh. at all. And it, it, just, you know, it just strikes me as so ironic that you know, reading about what, uh, uh, this is a Wikipedia article, was quite entertaining. And <laughs> You're reading Wikipedia? <laughs> yeah, and they talked about how a, a thing that, that uh, is done if there's a figure uh, being rendered is to have a line across the throat to show that this is something that cannot live in the real world. And there like, you have a classic. Like, like, there, like there in, Ullman, class in, in Ullman, this, uh, this uh, uh, piece of glass is cutting off the head uh, in, in the, uh, the, the, the Ullman, the, 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 oh, the, the horror film. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, but, uh, cutting the heads off makes all people equal. Uh, the revolution yeah. uh, uh, knew it. <laughs> and that's a democratic side. Of it. But that's a typical artification trick. Cutting heads off. It's a good thing, huh? <laughs> Making a line. Like, say, like, say, like when, when I studied architecture, uh, we had to draw uh, uh, after nudes. And uh, my, most of my uh, colleagues there painted these nudes with, without the faces but with a lot of pubic hair. <laughs> That's interesting. It's, it's very interesting. So uh, you have to cover your private parts and you ha have to take your face off. Uh, most unprivate uh, part away from the body. Uh, Facebook shows that yeah. this is what you're allowed to show. This is interesting. This is, is an architectural, uh, uh, it's, um, it's a way of thinking for architects, uh, for uh, the normal iconoclast, uh, for uh, the true believer. Uh, there is only one who is allowed to have a face and this is God. <laughs> and you cannot show it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you are coming to see this face once. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> so don't, don't get your high. You, high. not me. But <laughs> this is another thing. I worship another god. Well, I think I have more uh, an interest in the in the Inuit way of uh, thinking about life after death. If you want to continue hunting seal when you're dead, you should be thrown in the sea. But if you're buried on land, then you end up in heaven. And then there are only like f flies that turn into birds when they come into heaven. So you can probably chase the birds, but you don't get to chase seal anymore. Then you can choose. Yeah, at least you have two choices. But going back to the, the, the whole idea of the museum. Yeah, but, but, yeah. but and the Arabs. Yeah. I cannot really that, 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 okay, that, can, There can, is can, now the effort to, to take the Louvre uh, uh, to uh, an Arab state. They have an agreement there yeah. to but, finance the, the, the poor Louvre because the French state uh, doesn't have the resources anymore. And they're transporting uh, all this uh, stuff to people who are not allowed to see it. <laughs> It's, it's a, a next level of... Uh, <laughs> yeah, but that, that's the absurdity. I mean, I cannot really see that there is a culture crash at all. It's the same, no, no, same way of thinking. Uh, uh, the, now you're beginning to see it. Uh, the, the symbiosis uh, uh, between uh, certain kinds of religion, very developed kinds of religion, uh, and it could stand like that. Art is a religion, uh, the, the Muslim uh, belief is a religion. They uh, absolutely work together. Yeah. And uh, in Europe, uh, Christendom is not longer relevant. But in America, you have a completely yeah. different situation in America. Well, I mean, okay, so what do you think? Is the problem uh, monotheism or is Christianity... Uh, a solution. <sighs> Why are you coming with these questions to me? Um, after all, I do not think that there were religions in the old time. Right. Uh, when, when you are living in the Stone Age, you uh, need, you are eating meat, you have, do not have the possibility uh, to, to buy something in a store, you have to hunt, you need your meat. You need uh, at minimum two kilograms of meat a day as a man, yeah? Two kilograms of meat. So you are out there hunting, you don't have time for a religion and you are not a naive person uh, thinking about strange theories you have to be very realistic to get your meat even when you are a farmer at the place you have to work all day you have to be realistic to survive mm. it's it's like like in the, uh, In the old times, uh, for example, but when uh, communities are more and more developed, and no one ever explained me why we do not talk about a renaissance in Egypt and uh, the Baroque in Greece, uh, when all cultures are equal <laughs> in old times. But uh, when I'm thinking about the old uh, dynasties, and we once tried to think about this, when you have the representation of uh, Hu Hurus, mm -hmm. uh, the falcon, uh, which is the prince. In the old dynasties, it was the prince and the little falcon. And then the falcon, over time, became bigger and bigger and bigger. And in the last dynasties, there was a falcon with a little prince. <laughs> and it's the same development with a religion in Europe. Mm -hmm. It was reality with a little bit of symbolism. Right. And it became in the uh, 1800s an obsession. 
and really an obsession for a religion with a little bit of realism. <laughs> and this was then exported to the US and they uh, continuously think that religion is everything. Uh, I'm not advocating against it, uh, but you have to do your work. This is the most important thing. And then you can have your religion too. Hmm. So uh, when we are talking now about developed religions, we are talking about a kind of monotheism from the l late 1800s, as Christendom, Muslim belief, or art. Yeah. Uh, one thing I noticed which was so disappointing, I mean, we went to, to uh, the cloister of milk, outside <laughs> of Vienna. Which is an amazing Baroque church. You know, it's like, but, uh, this well, is the place to go, and this is the place to stay for eternity. Well, I, y y do yeah. you know that I wanted to uh, to be uh, a monk? Uh, well, you, uh, you remember what that monk, uh, what I said to that monk when we were there. We were together with your your friend. It's culture monk. It's culture monk. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we were together with your friend who was a former monk, um, uh, and I I said Thomas. Yeah, and I said that if you become a monk, I will become a Catholic. And the, the, the monk thought that was a very good idea. But then I saw in the courtyard when they had new sort of murals there, and it was all art. And that was such a huge di disappointment. I thought the Catholic Church had some kind of integrity, some kind of consciousness. They don't, they don't prote protect their own people anymore. Uh, one of my uh, protectors was uh, had a high position in the church mm. in, in Austria, and uh, he tried to. Uh, pre he, he was responsible for uh, for art uh, in the Catholic Church in Austria in this part, oh. and uh, ha wanted to integrate me as a painter. Um, uh, so he took some material and had to show it to others. He came back uh, with the explanation, it's not possible uh, to come into the system. It was not possible for me to get you in. They said, it is not art. This was in the happy uh, 1990s. Yeah. And it Before was not changed. a shock for me. I knew that what I was doing was not art. I didn't have the term we played with it in the 90s uh, we played with the term kitsch but it wasn't fully developed uh, but uh, the catholic church nowadays has a higher religion and this is art this is scary you have the highest religion is money then you have different concepts of God's money, it uh, de depends on, on which church you are in. Uh, but the highest is money, and under this is art, and under this are several other religions. Mm -hmm. And now uh, another religion takes over a, a state-funded religion, which is equality. And they may be taking over a new religion, uh, which is easily explained by demographics. And this is uh, the belief into climate change. Mm. <laughs> and there is the same thing going on. Because uh, you get in this belief uh, the same uh, experience as in other religions. Uh, the human being is not just a biological being, but uh, the human individual is of importance for the cosmos, for the big everything. So people were suffering without a strong religion, and the young people are finding this new religion. I'm important again. I made climate change. I can rescue the world again. It's my sin, and uh, it it has everything uh, this uh, these uh, European religions had. So th I see this coming, and these mm. people who are now uh, coming to Europe, 
you see, uh, the uh, demographic uh, development, it's important for me to talk about this because it's reality. Uh, in the region of the Middle East, you had a demographic uh, uh, development uh, in the amount that, that in some countries until 10 times more people than after World War II. Five to 10 times more people. So these people there are suffering, not because of war or religion, uh, but because they are feeling as young men that they are not important anymore. They have no place to be. So they want to go to a place uh, where they are accepted as human beings. But the interesting thing is they have a cultural background. And when I saw now I'm uh, talking like a woman uh, with, with many examples, and uh, you should not take it as an example, but uh, as a comparison uh, with, with uh, other uh, thinkings you have in your mind. Uh, as I'm uh, trying to live, uh, you cannot call it life in Sweden now, <laughs> uh, I'm usually also playing as a musician in a Viking bar in Stockholm. Uh, it's really funny, it pays my rent at the moment, so nothing against that. And I'm free to do with the rest of my week what I want to do. Uh, it's always late when I'm uh, taking the train out of the town, which means that uh, uh, the many young men around uh, late in the night in the train and people from the, uh, some young men from from the uh, near east and africa apparently i don't know i didn't ask them because i didn't did not want to offend them i didn't ask them where they're coming from they're about talking swedish uh, they uh, began a conversation with me. Ah, you're a musician. It was a group of about five people. Oh, you're a musician. This one, it was someone who looked a little bit African. Uh, this one is, is a musician too. A lot of percussion going on in head. They tried to be friendly. They tried to contact the uh, younger women around while we were talking. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I had a look at them, I tried to, uh, to uh, be as friendly as possible and it's not that easy when it's late in the night and they were uh, in the best mood. Uh, and then they were telling a story, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. and they heard it, uh, you're talking Norwegian. This one, he is going to Norway now because uh, Sweden has no culture but the Norwegians have a maybe culture there. What? Yeah, and then I. I, I <laughs> what did he? Uh, and these were. Uh, 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 they were not freshly at the place. So they spoke a language. Uh, they, uh, you can describe them as a well integrated uh, uh, refugees, uh, what you want to call them. Uh, and they were open, try to contact others, and mostly women. Uh, <laughs> And they openly said, Sweden has no culture. Several of them say that when we came here, we thought that this is, uh, that they have culture here. This is why we came. They, we did not see anything of it. So uh, we have to go to Norway. Maybe that it's a little bit better. And I tried to explain it to these young men who tried to find an importance, their importance in another country, uh, that it was maybe not possible when so many of, of them came to uh, show them uh, and let them take part in the culture the Swedes have, because there is also Swedish culture, and this culture is strong, but it maybe takes a little bit more time to have access to it. They were silent, I think, because they were trying to think about it. So, 
but see the Swedish process. And every night in Sweden is a last night in Sweden. <laughs> mm. So, <laughs> was a wonderful saying. I love it. <laughs> uh, when in an integration process for a state, and we can call it state that it's not longer possible to show a little part of a culture, a part of democratic values, uh, women rights, uh, political and, and, issues, uh, yeah. the language in a very basic form. Uh, then something went wrong. So what is happening now, and I see it overall, um, that the art system knows that they have to adapt to the new situation coming in the future. Mm. But uh, it's not accurately that there are coming so many taxpayers. Uh, so the uh, state funding will go down. The galleries went go, uh, down, the conservative families go down. This is why we, don't, uh, we do have the situation. So art, the art system, uh, and you'll see it everywhere, tries to adapt uh, 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 to uh, these new cultures tries to adopt itself to uh, these new uh, thinkings. And this is a going on process. And they will have a problem which uh, was in a way uh, something they never talked about. They will have a problem with the funding of the uh, collections of older paintings or sculptures or artifacts, which are of no value for a new population. Okay, so you, you um, are describing a situation where uh, uh, basically it would be financially difficult to keep the whole museum system. And I think you know, the whole idea of what is seen as a goal for a painter is is uh, something that has to be changed. I mean, this is why I have the picture of the Salon here yeah, as well. well we could and talk about I, I want that to, because want this was the reality of the uh, 1800s. Yeah, and, I want, and, and want there to were no galleries. Yeah, and I want to get to that, but but uh, I think we'll look at some questions from the audience first, um, and then we'll finish off with some. Uh, We'll talk about why. Uh, also, we have why? the middle painting here and this. What is this decoration? <laughs> it's a nice assembly of colors, isn't it? Color? I like color. <laughs> <laughs> I know you kind of swore that it's not your painting on the wall there. No. No, I'm really sorry. I did not make this. No, well, you're <laughs> sorry that it's not your painting yeah, on the wall. Is, it's not my, my stuff. No, who is it? Oh, this is, this is a photograph of a painting. It yeah. was called Vermeer. He Vermeer. painted 40 paintings. Think of that. That's amazing. 40 paintings, not 400, not yeah. 4,000. Uh, go to a gallery and say, you, yeah, I have uh, five paintings uh, made of the, over the last 15 years. Oh, mm -hmm. I take a show on, on 50 to 90%. So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but your questions. Let's take them first. Uh, okay, so we'll try to keep the answers a bit shorter. Quite simply, what should be the goal of a painter? Question to me. <laughs> There's a lot of questions. The actually. goal of, 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 of a good kitsch painter. Yes, I think that's what is in the uh, first step to survive. <laughs> to survive? Yeah. A living warrior is better than a dead warrior. <laughs> so I want to stay alive a little bit longer to, to make it. But the goal is the masterpiece. We know it. Hmm. Uh, this quote about people should not have access to paintings. <clears throat> There's a comment um, a person who likes the quote. Though it seems it's not a personal belief of colors, but may maybe the attitude of the elite. Does Boris think therefore art is specifically designed for public consumption in their state of indoctrina indoctrination and confusion, while the paintings are reserved for the powerful elite to reflect upon? 
In other words, if art is for the people and paintings, non-art is for the elite. Uh, when you uh, call uh, someone who can afford a painting as powerful, then maybe. <laughs> But uh, I think the powerful on, uh, on the side of art. So I'm thinking uh, of uh, the old system. Mm -hmm. Someone who can afford it and has a strong family, collects strong paintings, and not the painting which is sold in a gallery and uh, it looks good in artificial light on one evening, on one overpaid evening where you pay uh, uh, a fee for, for, your, for your Prosecco uh, of 50% uh, of the purchase. Uh, it's, uh, it's not like that. You could go directly to the painter, you could collect, you could take care of the paintings, and you could see the paintings develop uh, themselves on the wall. They change all the time. Uh, I could talk maybe next time, if there's a next time about this. Uh, and you will uh, change over time with a painting. So it's important to live with a painting. Uh, going, uh, uh, looking at the painting for two to eight seconds in a museum, it's not sufficient to see a painting, not mm. in a, a, a artificial light. So the paintings uh, are not uh, seen in a museum. It's not possible to see them. They are dead as uh, musical instruments are dead in a museum. There is no music for paintings in a museum. You have to live with your painting. Purchase your painting. Mm. <laughs> <clears throat> There's a question from Facebook here. Does color, Mr. Kohler feel that we define ourselves by having a nemesis to oppose? I understand that in general, fashions are against the type of art Mr. Nurdin, for example, makes, but the other side of the coin in a postmodern climate is that we can make art as we like. Uh, society seems to be moving toward a plur plurality of expression from religion and politics to art. <laughs> there is room for all without having to compete. Uh, who pays for it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, there is a myth uh, that there is a prospering uh, market out there uh, for uh, the uh, conventional artist, the figurative artist. They, it's a myth in the uh, art world that they have a market. They, uh, most of the painters out there are figurative painters, they think. So uh, they have this enemy to fight against. Mm. Uh, it's a symbolic enemy because it, uh, this enemy does not exist. Uh, now for uh, um, over 100 years, uh, they are taking in uh, young people into the academies. Many of them uh, wanted to make a good painting. Uh, they were gifted, uh, they, they, they had uh, some talents that, that were um, attending an academy and th there they are finding a place for re-education. It is an enemy for art, uh, when, uh, the, what they call traditional painting or um, conventional uh, figurative painting or classical figurative painting, which is a really bad word. I would never use it. They want to fight against kitsch. It's as simple as that. So don't think that there is a safe space for us. At the moment, not. So there's a question from Facebook, I think would be the last one, uh, which leads us to the idea of the salon here. Uh -huh. Painters continue to be rejected by the gallery system, despite, <laughs> despite the surge in the popularity of traditional painting since the 1980s. Does feel, Boris feel a tipping point coming. If not, what, if anything, does he feel could instigate that tipping point? Is the gallery system an outmoded mechanism for painters to present their work to collectors and the public? Indeed, it is outdated as a system. Um, the gallery uh, system killed off the uh, salon. Mm. And there uh, are papers about this. Um, the so long uh, tradition, when we take the example of France, there was an annual uh, salon uh, since the 1600s. Uh, and there you cannot talk about 
something state uh, supported, uh, but it was royal family. And when you provide a space to show good paintings once a year, if someone wants to buy, come, uh, there is no share with the gallerist, uh, the money goes directly to the painter, more or less. Mm. So uh, it's nothing more than an annual market and for a not slowly changing system like uh, old type painting is, uh, it was fast enough to have an annual exhibition. And uh, then, and as said, people wrote about this, uh, in the inner conflicts and uh, some outer conflicts, uh, some painters des decided when there were more or more uh, painters around that they cannot have, when they cannot have a place in the salon, uh, where there is a jury uh, uh, which decides uh, whom is taking part in the salon and who is not. Uh, they decided to make and to organize own salons. So there were uh, m many salons. Uh, it began with two, three, and then a kind of modernism began. You have to produce faster. You are not allowed to invest that much time. There is a private seller who can buy up cheap paintings uh, and uh, speculate uh, that it's possible to sell these paintings later much more expensive of. And that the gallery system comes into the picture. But mm. as fast as you have galleries, and it didn't take a, a, a big share in the beginnings, some percents, not 50 as today or 90 as in Japan, uh, it was in a way possible uh, uh, to build up a symbiosis between these modernist painters and the gallerists. Gallerists stood never uh, for uh, this kind of traditional painting, mm. that, uh, which found right. the uh, place in the salon. So it was the last step to the grown up uh, modernist in uh, Law's thinking. Uh, to develop a new market where it's more important that you speculate uh, with an artifact and not uh, that you purchase a painting which you can have on the wall. You want to have a good painting on the wall. This is why they had these awards in the salon. Uh, but uh, that in a, in a gallery, it they were able to buy in whatever someone made it, and the quality was to uh, sell it to a higher price. So the, the price is, begins to be more important uh, than the painting. Mm. So you, you don't see any future in the gallery system? It's a new system. When we think about gallery system, 130 years in developed countries uh, okay. like France. So uh, it came, mm, this is the much later into the picture in Germany. Uh, this is why I'm telling uh, you about uh, so, okay, so dates for France. If we, uh, if we transition then towards, uh, I think what we'll finish off with. I mean, here, here you have Vermeer, the <laughs> artist in his studio, as it says. No, no, no. <laughs> We don't have the time to talk about this now. No, no, no. Okay, but, but, okay. Listen, no, listen, 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 listen. No, listen. it's, it's the fame of the Catholic Netherlands. Uh, uh, and that the painter is painting yeah. this. Right, right, uh, right. So uh, I could go into the composition uh, to, to tell you what it really means here. But it's, it's not about art at all. It's about uh, Catholic uh, Habsburg propaganda. <laughs> And this is what Adolf Hitler liked a lot, and this is why we hang it up, because it was his favorite painting. <laughs> now I've said it. Well, they talk about that taste. <laughs> and uh, uh, all of us, the best example. <laughs> then the best example for that taste is... Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's so funny, you know, uh, I remember seeing this uh, Austrian art historian talk, <laughs> talking about the nude by Hitler. And she was criticizing it because it was so bad. And I was looking at it and I was thinking, well, if you take away the name, just look at it. 
it's a perfectly okay nude. Yeah, but and if maybe Eva looked like that. <laughs> how can an art historian know how Eva looked like when she was naked? <laughs> well, actually, I think it was a male nude. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. I don't want to think about that. <laughs> no, okay, so what I was getting at, um, <laughs> as opposed to the gallery system, as opposed to the salon, the situation Vermeer was in, how is that different in terms of selling? Is that something to be learned from that? <sighs> when uh, people are thinking about uh, Leonardo as an artist, I would like to see him in the art system today as a classical figurative painter coming with his Mona Lisa and he spent about four years on, on this painting and <laughs> made some drawings on the side but it didn't fit in the frame. So, uh, so he tried to, to uh, finish uh, one portrait, uh, <laughs> moved uh, a lot and uh, I hope that someone paid for, for uh, this, these journeys. And he's contacting a gallery and after uh, contacting uh, about 30, 40 galleries, he finds a gallery in France uh, uh, and they like his work and they see the Mona Lisa. Oh, yes, uh, can you make 30 of these and make <laughs> them a little bit cheaper? <laughs> so, you see, there is a difference. Yeah in the values and in the system. Uh, Leonardo could not have survived uh, uh, as an artist, mm -hmm. maybe with his mathematics, but not with his paintings. Well, then you're getting back to that you have to change the whole way of thinking. But, 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 but think of, of the Pope in Rome uh, asking a jury of art historians and people uh, f from the academic system how uh, uh, the 16 uh, chapel should look like. Sorry, it's, today it's like that. <laughs> yeah. And you see on um, which low level a Pope stands today. That's a sad, so sad you, you, have, you have someone who uh, can make the walls and you have someone who uh, promises you that he will pay once. <laughs> so you, you take a chance as a Michelangelo. Mm. You are not allowed to make the grave monument because of other stories really angry on the Pope and he lets you paint this wall so you are occupied for four years. This is not the art system. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> You're actually employed. Uh, uh, not really. <laughs> you, you, are, no. you shut up for four years. <laughs> <laughs> well, you get to make it's, a living out of your work. So, right? waiting for mm. commissions. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, commissions would be a way, way to, um, to go. It's cheaper for, for the customer, better paying for a for, for Yeah, painter. I understand. They can save like 50-60% at least. It, it, it's much better for, 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 for the painter and what is the gallery doing? It's, it's a really expensive glass of Prosecco. And uh, uh, you show them only the other uh, uh, who attend the, the, the show in the gallery that everything is for free. It is not. I sell my paintings. I want to be happy too. But then uh, I'm thinking of there's been several uh, attempts then at this. And uh, when you come into to how a culture, uh, how you get culture then, you know, you can say that there always needs to be a driving force from Pericles to the Counter-Reformation or what Stalin did or Hitler did or whatever. There comes someone in and says, this is the way it should go. Uh, and, I mean, what happened then in the 30s in Germany with the culture uh, the, politics? Uh, the, and the 30s in, in Germany were, were completely different uh, than the 30s in, in France. In France you had a developed uh, gallery system, not that much in Germany. For example, in uh, München, which was the painter's town. Uh, you had the Glaspalast, where the big exhibitions were. Uh, they held a salon, uh, they had also other uh, exhibitions with paintings from the uh, 1800s. 
and then this glass palace uh, uh, burned down and uh, the Adolf Hitler came into the picture and he was a painter and he liked painting uh, and wanted to do something for his colleagues. He saw them as colleagues <laughs> this time. Mm. So there had to be another building in a town for big exhibitions. And when you uh, have your uh, main town for your movement, uh, which is by chance also the art town in the country, we're talking now about art, then you try to combine it. Mm -hmm. So you will give your fellow uh, uh, colleagues a possibility to show your paintings like they wanted to show them uh, in a good place directly to, to uh, uh, the customers. A little fee goes off, but not the 50%. Nobody thought about it. And uh, Adolf uh, gets, in a way, his showcase to show what one could do. And the painters in these times, uh, they were educated in the late uh, 1800s and uh, early uh, 1900s. So um, these painters were, when you see also into the uh, catalogs from the exhibitions between the wars, and that we cannot talk about uh, uh, painterly propaganda, uh, it was figurative for yeah. high quality painting in, in the tradition of the uh, 1800s uh, until the 1920s. So when you think about Picasso and, and Brack and, and all these uh, uh, stories about early heroic modernism, and uh, complete drunk Cezanne and all these. Uh, it, it was not uh, uh, in the picture of uh, the people in, in Germany or France. It was not reality. It's the storytelling now. They are telling you another uh, story today than what was reality yeah, this time. So I, I, I don't know if I mentioned that example the last time we, we spoke here, but there was uh, not too many years ago an exhibition with figurative painting at a, a fairly large uh, gallery in Stockholm, mm -hmm. outside of Stockholm. And it was, I was a part of it, and there was a former Northern students and, and a lot of others from the 90s, 80s, and yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, specifically, one of them was accused of being making Nazi art. Because there was a woman there, na nude woman with mm. some curves and stuff, uh, and that was supposed to be typical of the, the sort of the eroticism and the sentimentality of Nazi painting, as you said. Now, is there a specific style under in the thirties, forties in Germany? Uh, I went, because you had the question already once, I went through the catalogs, tried to find an, uh, uh, an overall overview of the material, of what they really want, uh, wanted to show them, what was possible to show, what hang uh, on the walls, and the Haus der Kunst has now uh, accessible uh, a documentation also as a website. You can go in and see what has been exhibited there. was yeah. in which exhibition on which wall. It's a great work there. And uh, you have a continuity of uh, biographies over time, over 20s into the 30s, partly on, until the 50s, 60s, when they survived the war, uh, which was never sure. So. A lot of uh, biographies are now contaminated uh, with uh, these 12 years of German history. But the people exhibiting there, they only wanted uh, uh, to have access to customers. Yeah. The customers wanted to buy paintings and they bought a lot. And the situation, and it, it makes it double bad for, for figurative painting in the southern Germany. These people bought a lot and it's not possible to uh, sell um, 
paintings these painters made, even when these paintings are not from these 12 years. And uh, this fills an uh, art market uh, where families are sitting really on paintings they want to sell. And uh, the market is fed. Right. So uh, these paintings are quite good partly, uh, but it's not possible to sell them. So when you are coming in uh, with your paintings into this situation, uh, they will compare you with uh, these paintings at once because you are directly competing with them. This is on the market, you are on the market, which prices do you have, which paintings are these. So it, it's not that they have so much propaganda, the propaganda was shown in films and documentations, but most of these uh, paintings were normal paintings. Mm. And then, uh, long time after, when the people who bought this time uh, died off uh, in the 70s, 80s, uh, it became more and more uh, common in, in art circles to see paintings of this time as Nazi painting. And it has uh, to do also with uh, the reaction of the uh, 69, uh, 68 uh, uh, generation, the other, these students, uh, uh, this left, they thought they were left wing, they had to react uh, against the parents. So, uh, so, so they began to call them as Nazis and uh, these paintings as Nazi paintings. And this sits quite deep. Yeah. So it's actually often not like that, that there were propaganda, uh, but common painting. So it's also a narrative which comes quite late into the picture. What, what usually is shown uh, today of uh, paintings uh, from this period is uh, where there is shown also, also German military in battle. But this is another thing. Uh, in every in each country, you had painters out with the troops. Yeah, well, this uh, one, this one, for example. Oh, yeah. And this is no. why I didn't want to have a, a, a German uh, soldier on the wall. <laughs> and this is uh, why we chose uh, this one. On the other side uh, of, of, of frontier, uh, th there were uh, also real propaganda. Because this is a uh, American, or was it British? Uh, it's well, a, a guy called Stoops. Right? Stoops, uh, yeah. and uh, I'm not into uniforms, <laughs> uh, but oh, you, you, have, yeah. you have a soldier with a gun protecting uh, the common man. The soldier is big yeah. and uh, ghostly big, and the common man is uh, kept smaller. So it's a lot of symbolism going on. <laughs> You might As say in the that, yeah. Egyptian yeah. dynasties. <laughs> um, so it's a wonderful example. When yeah. you're talking about propaganda, how much can you propagate uh, with paintings when, when it takes so much time to make a painting? And then it's on the private wall. Mm. Uh, you can live with uh, such a painting, but it doesn't have a propagandistic effect uh, as, as a poster or an illustration. And posters and illustration and modern movies uh, make a better job on, on propaganda. Yeah. I think according to, um, this is a oh. really good book. Hitler I and really the, like him. Hitler and the Power of Aesthetics, Friedrich Spots. There's a lot of information here. And I, I, th I guess it's in this book, he quite clearly says that, uh, that uh, Hitler couldn't stand uh, propagandistic painting. <laughs> it, it said, um, the, 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 before the first opening of the uh, Große uh, uh, Ausstellung. The great German in, uh, exhibition. In, 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 in Haus der Deutschen Kunst. Uh, and people said it was uh, funded with private money from, from uh, uh, s uh, selling his, his book, uh, My Struggle. <laughs> uh, so it was a personal thing for Adolf uh, as a painter, you know. <laughs> Uh, he wanted to succeed in, in Vienna and then he went into politics. Uh, it's very good that I did never go into politics. <laughs> I would not b uh, build a museum. 
No. But uh, tool for destruction. He, he wanted to show, and he wanted to see the show uh, at first, b before the opening. Mm. He, he was really looking forward to it. He was coming into the hall and he went crazy. <laughs> he went really crazy. He hated the exhibition. They had to take uh, about 100 paintings down. Why? Because he, uh, he personally uh, was not able to stand it. It was bad quality. But bad quality in what sense? Yeah, what, what, what did he write? Think about only 12 years. While you, uh, um, uh, some painters make uh, the production which has to stand for the uh, eternal evil in, of all time. So these paintings, there were not, not many painters, you know. Uh, they try to introduce uh, to introduce a law that when you're building a house, you have to give uh, you have to invest two percent uh, of uh, the expenses That's into, Norwegian cultural into, politics. into art. It was not possible to follow the law because there were not so many artists in Germany. <laughs> After World War I, there were not so many artists in Germany <laughs> to follow the law. So it was a system in construction. And uh, Adolf came in and uh, he expected that uh, people did something with this possibility. And it was simply not possible in a short time. Yeah, of course. And, and but, this but, famous but, painting where he is depicted uh, as, uh, as, as a knight, knight uh, uh, with, with a flag. He really, really hated this one. <laughs> because it was just too much. He was a modern man. Yeah, yeah. but that, that's the thing. So this is the quote I, I found here. Because what confuses me a bit is that on the one hand, I mean, he talks about, uh, and I read the, the speeches there, this, he does talk a lot about eternal values and things that are not hindered by the times, the spirit of the times and stuff. But then it says here, uh, it, then it also talks about those who were backward looking and had a quaintly old German notion of art. They lived in some <laughs> laughable Germanic dream world and lacked the slightest idea of what the National Social Revolution was all about. So today they propose railway, way, railway stations in original German Renaissance styles, street signs and typewriting in old Gothic letters, um, and shields and crossbows as weapons of defense. And he ridicules uh, quite a few places this rom romanticized worldview uh, but, but as, that, a, as, as a theme for painting. There were so many clubs uh -huh. as, as today. That it's more uh, developed today and it, it's, uh, these are really anti-fascist groups when you know them. Uh, these new Vikings, for example, or the reenactment from uh, uh, certain medieval periods. Uh, these movements were going on uh, already during the uh, 1800s. Mm. Uh, people acting as old Germans or Vikings, uh, uh, they bought some fur and uh, some funny helmets and they were lying around and drinking mead and, uh, <laughs> and felt themselves very Germanic and he hated these people. He wanted to have modern citizens. Yeah. Uh, because it, it was the, uh, the other side of the mirror for uh, USA. And uh, it was a shock and a, quite a surprise for the US uh, after the war uh, that they succeeded in the re-education of the Germans, but not of other countries where they came in uh, with the cultural information. <laughs> the CIA, the Cultural Investment Agency, yeah. <laughs> information. Yeah. <laughs> they invested a lot. Uh, uh, I tell you some stories about this later. <laughs> After the show. After the show. Okay. <laughs> right. So he, 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 um, the Germans, in contact with uh, USA, they only tried to make what uh, they made in the US, the left wing uh, people in the US, uh, who developed a um, uh, kind of fascism. Mussolini was, uh, was really... Uh, uh, was, um, 
well, inspired uh, enthusiastic, by yeah. uh, uh, and uh, he tried to make it like the Americans. Uh, uh, not that the racism this was too much for Mussolini, but uh, uh, the um, uh, this German uh, Arbeiterpartei <laughs> uh, was was very uh, uh, into it because they were early from the 1920s financed uh, uh, from the side of the U.S. They got a lot of money mm -hmm. to build up the party in Germany and. Uh, Germany should be a model for uh, the USA. So USA, in the core, wanted to act like Germany, and Germany wanted to act like the US. This is why uh, the German soldiers, when they had the chance uh, during the war, uh, that they thought uh, in the battles that it would help when they ran against uh, the Americans and give up. Uh, because they saw the Americans as friends, not not the Russians in the <laughs> uh, not even the French, <laughs> and they could be natural friends. Uh, no, no, they went to the Americans. So there was something in the head that uh, the Americans and the Germans that has developed something together. And uh, when you see the afterward developments in Germany. They are in contact with the American uh, changes, true. But uh, that the problem is they wanted to re-educate the, what, what, uh, the people who were left in, in Germany um, and came from other countries, Germans from other countries. It, you can imagine what happened in Germany this time. Uh, and wanted to build new states, new German states. There were uh, three states again for, for Germans, uh, when you don't count the uh, Schweiz. Uh, so there was a lot of politics going on and uh, secret service. And uh, you wanted to make yourself sure uh, that everything's going right with the artists. It was very cheap. And uh, there you had to uh, invest in, you can call it art clubs. This is how they started uh, uh, up art in uh, Germany during the early 1800s. Mm -hmm. uh, what is called as uh, Kunstverein. Uh, you could translate it to art club. It's another system. So people are collecting uh, together uh, paintings. In, in a kind of club. Mm. So you have access uh, to uh, artists, you have access to prints, uh, you can make exhibitions uh, which are not funded by the state. And this is the way Germans, for example, they build up uh, their clubs and their local museums. This was a private initiative. And uh, the People in the U.S. thought it would be a good idea to make this. It's very cheap. The uh, artists after the war they were uh, only want to drink. Uh, so there was a. a, a, a <laughs> I don't have the list here. I could have taken it with me, but, but uh, it, it's on Wikipedia. <laughs> uh, I was in Vienna and I always thought that the CIA uh, didn't get the foot into the Austrian system uh, until the late uh, uh, 40s, until uh, 49. But uh, the art club, uh, as a private club for artists, and then also curators and historians, uh, was uh, founded more or less directly after the war. Young people. And when you see a list of the so-called members, m big part of them became later on uh, professors on the uh, universities in Vienna and the big artists. So uh, when you see it in a retrospective, it was very important to be about uh, a part of this club. Then you made it for your life. When you did not, you were dead for life, more or less. And then uh, Wieland uh, Schmidt uh, is only known in Austria, but uh, please research it uh, uh, in other countries. Uh, I, I'm sure that it was everywhere the same. He wrote about this uh, uh, about 15 years ago. 
that he had an idea that there was someone who had always money this time. And he was an Austrian aristocrat uh, who worked uh, for uh, the CIA in America. He was together with an American woman. And he was the one who had always money to help out. Uh, and uh, he has a name, Rudolf uh, von Ripper. Rudolf the Ripper. It's, <laughs> so I gave you this story. But yeah. when, when, you, when you see, and now I had, uh, we should talk about uh, some things here, three things. And I want uh, to shut up uh, too early. Uh, because we didn't talk about uh, the uh, German Siegesallee, which is the gap in between the Salon system and the uh, gallery system in Germany. And uh, we uh, did uh, not talk about uh, possible uh, solutions uh, for, for I your think, questions. I think you should uh, end with some solutions. Like how yeah, yeah. do we move out so of this? I, 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 I think when, when, I, when I see this, and we should, we should uh, have a talk about uh, uh, influence uh, of uh, other structures uh, in, up, on local um, cultural uh, structures. Uh, it, it, it could be very important to see, because when we are talking about uh, state propaganda, you really wanted to talk about this. Uh, there is a, a story for this, a history for this. Uh, Wilhelm, I th uh, think it was uh, the second, Wilhelm II in, in Germany, the emperor, uh, he wanted to install uh, groups of uh, uh, sculptures. In the mid of Berlin, uh, sculptures which uh, represent German history. And uh, they were made in a near Renaissance style, more or less beautifully made. Uh, the sculptures, they had worked for many years. It was a state investment and they sh showed uh, German history in a beautiful way. Uh, Victory uh, Avenue, Sigis Ali. Uh, it didn't stand that long because uh, some decades uh, later the war came. And in the 50s, not in 1945, but in the 1950s, uh, a local uh, um, conservator, uh, he, he had to protect the sculptures and it was not possible in these times. So he decided to bury these sculptures to protect them. And they were buried down until uh, the 1970s. Then they had to dig them uh, out again from the ground. This, uh, they are not uh, restored in any way. They, they officially, from state side, they have no values. You can touch them. It's, it's bad taste. What was once good taste uh, against the modern developments in the galleries. Uh, so uh, there you have uh, iconoclasm again. And when I, I see this painting here, for example, uh, Adolf's favorite. And the big war came. And I do not think that the European Union is uh, uh, coming to manage um, all the future of uh, all European history. So there will be wars. What are we doing then? They, they are building bunkers for modern art. Modern art is well protected, mm -hmm. like, like uh, politicians. So, <laughs> But how, how do you get out of the situation? Like, you, What would be your description of how we can move on from Yeah, but this. the problem is, what are we doing with this stuff? Art system is underpaid. Um, they try to uh, move the, the more important museums out of the system so that they are self-financed uh, by tourists um, to keep these paintings. Uh, but I do not see the, uh, that the structure comes to protect the older paintings for all time. And I gave you uh, the picture of many, many paintings in many families which will come onto the market, figurative paintings uh, from the 
1890s, uh, made from the 1890s to the uh, 1950s, 60s, about. They will come onto the market and they are not protected. And this is cultural heritage. And there are no longer the families to protect this. So what are we doing now? And this should be a, another cave of a palace. What could we do to build a new structure for this? Because when mm. art is now changing, it's conceptual, it's open for uh, uneconism uh, uh, and museums as uh, tools for uh, iconoclasm. People will not attend the old collections. I would like to protect these paintings. Uh, do you see how they protected uh, uh, the old paintings in the 1940s? No. There were salt mines in Austria, the countryside, in the mountains. And they brought all the paintings from Central Europe to these salt mines uh, that the paintings there could be protected uh, also after the war. So you blow up the entrance and then these paintings are buried for about 1,000, 2,000 years, well conserved in the salt. <laughs> and then when other times come, you can open the cave. Okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, is this a solution for us? And this could, we could talk about uh, the bloody producer in the background. He looks at his watch. <laughs> Uh, we could talk about this in the future. What the art system can do is to protect itself. They will not be interested in the old stuff. New populations in Europe are not uh, interested in protecting the old stuff in the long run. Uh, it's important to protect minorities because I'm a part of a minority uh, in about 20 years. <laughs> it's, isn't it wonderful? Uh, I'm a minority soon. I will be protected. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I think we don't have so much time to organize ourselves in that direction. That we uh, can build up a structure of expertise for the newer painting history. 1800s and the 1900s, no one took care of uh, certain parts of the 1900s. That we take uh, these painters uh, in as, as our friends because they made our paths. We uh, live in, not in empty air, uh, we have a history uh, back us. When we can provide new paintings uh, for this minority, we are jumping around with feathers on the head and playing Indians uh, in, in a special European way. So we have to hold the tradition and uh, singing our folk songs like Mozart, uh, but this <laughs> another cave. Uh, <laughs> then uh, we could give these uh, dying families something. So uh, build up some trust with these dying families who do not want to invest anymore in the art system. Give them another system of art clubs where they can invest. And uh, then when art is coming to struggle with itself and with a lot of integration, the path is open for us because kitsch could claim all the history before now. Not, not the art history. The, 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 oh. the artists can uh, have this for themselves. But uh, kitsch could claim everything from uh, uh, antique sculptures to uh, uh, Titian, uh, Rembrandt, Vermeer, uh, paintings from the 1930s uh, until now. And when we claim that we have the structure and the expertise and the artists don't have it because they are occupied with uh, integration or, uh, on another level, then we have something in our hands. So we should not think about art uh, uh, as a um, powerful system. It is not in the long run. 
especially when so many other people are not interested in uh, art or uh, our uh, history are coming. So it opens to a plural uh, plurality, to a plural uh, system uh, where many opinions could prosper for a while. There are groups who can have the carpets, there are groups who can worship uh, the empty hall, uh, there could be groups uh, integrating uh, whomsoever, and there could be someone uh, who has the expertise to take care of old and new paintings. I think that's a nice punchline. Yeah. Boris Kohler, <laughs> thank you for coming to the Cave of Pillars. And thank you for watching. Remember, you can support our show at patreon.com slash I'll see you next month.